From the land of lakes, this is 10,000 Takes. Brought to you by Minnesota Score Radio. Wally and Eric back for yet another week as we slice and dice the always busy, always topical, super saturated Twin Cities sports scene. And Wally, as usual, our plate is overflowing with topics. I see that uh, your Minnesota Vikings are back in the noon slot for this week's game against Detroit. No more prime time. That's probably a good thing. Did the ABC ratings crater <laughs> after that uh, just uh, horrible display in Philadelphia on Monday night? They probably cratered at halftime. That was about it because, uh, well, that was the final score, right? It was 24-7 yep. at the half, yep. and that's how it ended. And, uh, yeah, I mean, do we not have prime? Do we not have another primetime game all season? Oh, they saying? have a they have some. Oh, yes. okay. I, I see. I, you just mean but, from last but, week to yeah, this, this week. This week. Hey, oh, okay. Gotcha. Detroit at Minnesota. That's a guaranteed noon central oh, time yeah. start. That'll never be the doubleheader game. <laughs> It'll never be Monday night football. It might be Thanksgiving because, well, the Lions always play on Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, they're they're given that gift. That's gift wrapped for them year in and year out. But you know what? The Lions obviously are maybe a little bit better. I know you've been kind of uh Propping oh. them up, much like you prop the Tigers yes. up. So the Lions, see how by the way, <laughs> you're doomed. <laughs> well, if you look at the NFC North going into week two, it's like a picket fence. Everybody has a one and one record. So it's a four-way log jam. Uh, everybody's tied for first or last, depending on your perspective. So really, it's a huge game for the Lions. We're trying to become relevant, and it's very big for the Vikings, obviously. Yeah. Are you? Um, where are you on Kirk Cousins right now? Because, again, the Monday night thing was a debacle. I mean, he was terrible. I'm sorry. Yes, there were some missed routes, and you know, and he's not the only one to blame. There's no way you could do that because the defense didn't stop anybody in the first half either. But I still think that Kirk Cousins is may or may not be the guy that will get you over the hump. He might be able to get you to the playoffs like he's done once or twice, but to get you to a Super Bowl? I just don't see it. I really don't. No, and the quarterback is always going to be the lightning rod. If, if things are going well, the quarterback is you know gets is heaped with praise, right? And Kirk is certainly being paid uh, a ton of money. He's making a boatload of dough. And when things don't go right, you're going to get the criticism, as he should. Three picks against Philadelphia probably should have been four or five. I mean, Darius Slay had an outstanding game, and he dropped uh, another pick that he might have had. He had two that he actually made plays on. But, you know, Bill Parcells once said, the Hall of Fame coach, you are what your record says you are. Kirk Cousins entering the Lions game this week, 60 wins, 60 losses. Oh Two ties. So he's so average. He is. <laughs> I mean, he's average. Because this isn't fantasy football, folks. No, right. And he may put up some numbers some weeks for you fantasy geeks out there. This is about winning and losing. And when it comes to winning and losing, he's average. Yeah. And the numbers that he put up on Monday night, most of the good numbers were like the last drive when... They were cosmetic. Yeah, they really were. And, and of course, it didn't get a touchdown pass <laughs> in the final drive, as you well know. Um, but yeah, they were just, um, they're out of sorts last week. And I don't think what you watched Kirk Cousins in the pocket against pressure, against those blitzes, to me, that's where the problem comes. Because now you're asking him to make plays with his feet, make quicker decisions. And then he's got to be on the same page as his receivers, too, with those quick decisions. If he's going to hit somebody quickly because the blitz is on, then that's going to be up to him and that receiver to be on the same page. And I still think he can make throws, but he can't make yeah. plays. Yeah, and I think Philadelphia has now given the other teams around the NFL a blueprint or a template <laughs> on how to defend Justin Jefferson. Now, will everybody have the same success week in, week out that the Eagles did on Monday? Well, we'll see. But now you can at least see there there's something on tape these other coaches can look at, and they took him out of the game, and J.J., six catches, targeted 12 times. He, he wasn't a factor. As bad as things went for the Vikings on Monday night, at least it wasn't a gut punch, a game that they had and then just blew down the stretch, much like Cleveland did with the Jets giving up two touchdowns in the final, what, minute 50 or whatever it was to lose. And I was, as you know, I was in Cleveland last weekend, and I happened to be around the stadium as people were going in, uh, which, by the way, they have a tailgate scene there. You know, it's they're in a downtown, too. 
Much you like may want to Vikings. define what tailgating is to the uh, younger <laughs> Minnesota viewers because <laughs> no it's idea. a lost uh, art here in Minnesota. It doesn't I, exist I anymore. Yeah, it really doesn't. Um, yeah, I walked through because we were going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which was right next to uh, First Energy Stadium where the Browns play. And so we had to park where the tailgaters and where the fans were parking. And, man, they've, they've figured it out. They've got little nooks and crannies everywhere in downtown Cleveland, and they tailgate. And it's there. the music is going and the barbecues are going. And, um, and there's just people who go, and much like in Green Bay at Lambeau Field, they just go set up a television and have a party out in the parking lot. Yeah. And they never make it into the game. And, and that's common around the NFL when you is. have a tailgate vibe. So, you know, Cleveland, which is a downtown venue, as you mentioned, has cobbled together some sort of a tailgating scene. There's not one in Minneapolis. And I've said that the Purple Nation gets cheated. The game day experience at U.S. Bank Stadium is not nearly as good as it is in a lot of other places right. like Kansas City, Green Bay, Santa Clara, East Rutherford. Uh, you know, Buffalo, Houston, all these places with the huge footprints, you know, lots of blacktop. And where they get there early, they tailgate, go to the game, and then after the game, they continue the tailgate party. And the irony is, tailgating started in Minnesota at the old Met. And Min the Minnesota football, it's its drive up about, about a half hour before the game, yep. walk in, watch, and go home. There's no reason to stay in that area around the House of Noise. What are you going to do? No, and there there really aren't any or that many restaurants or bars that have popped up. There weren't many at the when no, the, the one was there. that was there closed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was Hubert's, and then it turned into something Eric's. else. Eric's, and it's the Reds, gone, and now. that's gone. Yeah, nothing survives there. It's yeah, you're right. It is a uh, it's not a destination. Is Valspar paint still there? <laughs> Maybe that's where everybody is before the game. Yeah, they're painting their face purple and gold. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, uh, it, I've been to most of the NFL venues, and Minnesota, as far as the game day vibe, ranks near the bottom. Yeah, maybe the very bottom, for all that matters. Could be. Although Chicago isn't very good either in downtown Chicago. No, there. but that'll change when they go to the Burps. Yeah. <laughs> They'll have a huge tailgating footprint yeah, in Arlington. They probably will. <laughs> All right. All right, stick around. We have a lot more coming up. We're going to talk to a couple who canoed from the BWCA to DC. Wow. Really? Uh. 10K takes your tailgating ticket. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. 10,000 Takes continues along, and uh, I know you like to get out into the wilderness, but I don't think you've ever done what our next guests <laughs> no. have done. I mean, it is amazing. <laughs> Uh, let's call them adventurers. I think that that's the best description, and they join us now. Dave and Amy Freeman from Ely, Minnesota. Uh, at one point, this was back in 2014, I understand, you canoed from the Boundary Waters all the way to Washington, D.C. There was a little sailing in between in there. Um, it's a long trip. How did you come up with this concept of going from the Boundary Waters in Minnesota all the way to Washington, D.C.? So obviously you went through the Great Lakes and did that whole nine yards. Dave, uh, give me the explanation on this one. Yeah, so actually... We had just returned to Ely. We'd been gone for about three years, traveling 12,000 miles across North America from near Seattle, Washington, up to the Arctic, sort of on a diagonal down to Key West. And we'd been exploring all these amazing places. And when we got back to Ely, um, we started learning about um, a copper mine that was being proposed right on the edge of the wilderness. and this action center called Sustainable Ely was just opening up and people said, hey, go check it out. So we went in there and they had this canoe that people were signing and we signed the canoe in support of protecting the Boundary Waters and said, what's gonna happen to the canoe? And they really proudly said, we're gonna put it on top of a car after it has thousands of signatures and we're gonna drive it to Washington, DC. And we said, you know, that's like 1500 miles. Canoes are meant to be paddled. 
let's paddle this canoe to DC instead. So about nine months later, we, um, we teamed up with uh, Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness, Save the Boundary Waters, and we we paddled that canoe to D.C. and and gathered thousands of thousands of partic- uh, petitions in uh, support of protecting the boundary waters from these copper mines. And, and Amy, I know the boundary waters is is sacred for so many people. Why should we not have copper mining on the fringes of one of the greatest? natural wild spots really on earth right well you described it there (laughs) because it's one of the greatest wild spots uh natural spots on earth uh the water is pristine when we paddle a canoe in the boundary waters we drink the water right out of the lakes Uh, where else can you do that um and it's 1.1 million acres of wilderness so that's when you consider that that's the highest level of protection in the the federal like um wilderness system and it's the the nation's most visited wilderness area Uh, there are just so many different reasons um also the the environment there is is sensitive to the type of pollution that would be generated from a copper mine acid mine drainage um there's no buffering capacity in the environment in the water there, there are just so many reasons to not put a copper mine just upstream from this precious wilderness area. Dave, how long did it take you guys to do this, to go from the BWCA to D.C. back in 2014? Um, it was like 100 days. I think it was 101 or 102 days. We left at the very end of August, and um, I think it was December 2nd. Oh, when we boy. reached DC, oh. yep. So it was getting cold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I it guess. Was, it was, yeah, and we're you know paddling through uh, beautiful locations like you know Philadelphia, and uh, <laughs> you know I mean we were urban areas, right? We paddled right right past the Statue of Liberty, um, you know, sort of through these very urban areas, uh, just sort of camping wherever we could, and you know it was very bare bones. We had a a uh, woman in her early 20s that followed us in this beat up old suburban and would cart us off to do radio interviews and media appearances and um, presentations where people would sign the canoe. So it was, it was really, you know, grassroots and just sort of like just making it work. And I know one photo that I saw from the BWCA to DC uh, canoe adventure was there wasn't water the entire way. So you actually had to put the canoes on your head and walk alongside an interstate between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. So you had to get out and hoof it, didn't you? That's true, we did. And part of that had to do with the weather. Uh, You know, we could have paddled kind of the long way around, but it would have taken us another, I don't know what day, like another week or something to do it. So we opted to go over land. But uh, we did something a little different than you would in the boundary waters instead of putting the canoe on our shoulders to carry it that whole way we actually had a little cart so some might consider that cheating but you know walking on a road it was helpful to to cart the canoe along (laughs) what tell me about the sailing portion of it you had mentioned that you sailed uh was it lake superior that you sailed across is that and and how was that compared to the canoeing because obviously the canoeing is was your forte having done that so much in the uh, boundary waters yeah, so so we had uh, like 40 events that we scheduled all along the way from, you know, small towns like, uh, you know, Munising, Michigan and Two Harbors, Minnesota to Washington, D.C. and Montreal and Ottawa, you know. Um, and so we sort of had to keep a schedule and we thought, you know, October on Lake Superior, like, you can't do that with big storms and stuff. So we paddled the, through the boundary waters and then we put it up, the canoe onto our 27 foot sailboat and we sailed it across Lake Superior and Lake Huron. And then we um, left the, the sailboat and we paddled um, through Ottawa and Montreal and, and down through Lake Champlain, down the Hudson River to New York City, and then through a series of small waterways to the Chesapeake Bay in Washington, D.C. All right, one more thought. Amy, behind you is the Chesapeake Bay. You're, uh, 
in Annapolis, Maryland, as we're doing this interview. Uh, both of you love Ely and the BWCA, but you're also smart. You're going to keep uh, canoeing south and sailing south, aren't you? You're not coming north for a while. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I think we've really gotten into just sort of the sailing lifestyle. I think because we've spent so much time paddling canoes and camping, it's like one step up, you know, glamping. It's like glamorous camping on a sailboat. <laughs> so so we can move our house around basically and and wake up in all these gorgeous places. I, I don't know if it's particularly gorgeous behind me today. We're in a city, right? But you can see all the boats behind me there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it looks good. It, it looks better than uh, what it'll look like here in, well, a few weeks. It'll be a lot, a lot chillier here in Minnesota. So, well, we appreciate you guys uh, spending some time with us. Good luck on your uh, next adventure, wherever that may take you, and hopefully we'll talk to you again down the road. Thanks a lot. Great talking with you. All right. Have Thank a good you. one. All right, you too. They are Dave and Amy Freeman, adventurers, canoeists, salesmen. Salesmen? <laughs> Sailboaters? Yeah. Whatever. Sailors. Sailors. <laughs> Back with more after this time off. Taxes don't have to be taxing, not with Keller Tax Service. For 20 years, Linda Keller has prepared taxes for all types of professions and businesses. She has perfected the virtual tax appointment through phone or video. With Keller Tax Service, you never leave home. Call KTS at 320-352-0013 or check out Keller Tax Service on Facebook. Take the anxiety out of taxing. Keller Tax Service, 320-352-0013 or check them out on Facebook. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. Maya? Oh, I love your earring. Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Ten thousand takes, and it seems like the Twins have about ten thousand losses the way they played in the second half of this season. I mean, look, they were in first place for most of the season. No matter who ends up, you know, winning the division, whether it's Cleveland or Chicago, because the Twins certainly aren't going to. I know they're not mathematically eliminated, but that's coming very soon. Um, I just think that it is a team that had plenty of opportunity to win the division. Now, they're going to blame the injuries. Are you buying that? I mean, some of it is injuries, of course, but what's led to all these injuries? I mean, how does one team have so many injuries? I mean, even Sonny Gray went on the injury list this week. It's just one person after the next. We know the Byron Buxton scenario. Miguel Sano. I mean, he just goes on and on. Jeffers, Polanco, yada, yada, yada. I think part of the blame, some of these injuries are legit. Let's, let's not go overboard. Well, I think they're all legitimate but, injuries. But, but I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, okay. That they, if, if you're nicked or dinged, then... This organization has the mindset of, let's put these guys in bubble wrap. We don't want players who are going to go out there and grind away and maybe play with some pain or play hurt. Well, that's part of baseball. It's 162 regular season games. Throw in another 30 in the you know, exhibition season. If you're lucky to get to the postseason, you're going to play more. So grinding has to be part of the equation, and the Twins don't do that. I just think the mindset of the organization, that coupled with the, the computer-driven analytics oh that have ruined the Twins and a lot of baseball, I think they need an organizational reboot. I think, go out and get me some tough guys. Go out and get me a manager who navigates a game with his heart and what he sees in the moment, not with some dumb laptop or a Surface or a tablet. <laughs> Yeah, no, and there's a lot of that, and, and it's it goes, you know, it goes right from whether to pull your pitcher or to keep them in there. It's so scripted. Yeah, it, it's every single time there is there seems to be no wavering on that, and I don't know how you manage a baseball team like that. And and I know that everybody wants to blame Rocco, and he's got to shoulder much as much of the blame as anybody else. But 
I think it goes above him. I think he's being told that this is the way we do things. This is how we do things. Paul Molitor would not, you know, go along with that. So Paul Molitor was let go. Rocco came in. They had great success right away with Rocco. They had the Bomba squad where they hit, what, 4,000 home runs yeah. in one season. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, it was fun to watch. But, you know, that started to fall apart when you don't have the guys that are hitting home runs. And you had a couple of injuries. And then Buxton goes down. And, you know, he's your main guy. You make a great move in getting Carlos Correa. Um, but, you know, they kind of kept him, as you like to say, in bubble wrap for a while this season. He wouldn't play every day. Carlos Correa needs to play every day. They they probably lost a game against Cleveland because Correa was the DH well, in, the, and think in one what, of those they, games. They, they came out and publicly said the goal for Byron Buxton was basically 100 games. Uh, Byron's had his issues. That's well documented. I, I don't know if we're ever going to see this guy on the field for 140 or more, which should be the goal. So they right away dumbed down the expectations. He's not going to hit the 100 mark. Right? I no. mean, so they're not even going to get to that, you know, uh, low bar of expectation when it comes to durability. Look, I think it was Bud Grant who once said, ability is great, but durability is even better. I need guys I can count on. And the Twins don't have that. And I think just this whole analytics thing and, you know, this, this blueprint that they stick to, I think it's boring. I think it's turned off a lot of fans in Twins territory. And... You're, you're exactly right. Rocco's a puppet for Derek and Thad no upstairs. Doubt. And there are other teams that do this too. Joe Madden, who got gassed by the LA Angels earlier this season, said the same thing, that Perry Manaya was dictating to him how he should manage. These newbies, these general managers, some of them who grew up on Wall Street, get out of there. Get out of the way. Let the manager manage. Yeah. Put on a uniform if you think you can do it. Yeah, it, this is baseball. This is not math. <laughs> no, I, it's know, not. It's, it's just not it's, economics. It's... I think one too many of these guys watched oh. one too many movies. Oh, boy. <laughs> they yeah. watched that Moneyball movie oh. and they live by it. Boy. Are you kidding me? It was that might have been a one time shot, you know? I mean, for all the pieces to come together like it did for the Oakland A's back in the day. And then they lost in the playoffs to the Twins. So it didn't really work because you don't win. If you don't win the World Series, it doesn't work. That's the last playoff series the Twins have won. It was 2002, right? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's, that's the last, 20 years ago. That's the last playoff game this team has won. Yeah, that's 20 years ago, too. 18 in a row, and it will stay at 18 at least for another and, season. And, and here's the kicker. They aren't even in contention in the final two weeks in the most mediocre division in Major League Baseball. Imagine the Twins in the AL East NL West, yeah, oh, be, NL East, they'd be thirty games they'd out. They'd be buried. They'd be thirty games yep. out. Well, I was in Cleveland to watch them this past weekend, and man, they did not look. My very condolences. Good. Yeah, well, <laughs> wow. Cleveland. I'm having good. to watch the Twins. Oh, I know okay. you're a Guardians guy. Yeah, Cleveland <laughs> looked good. Um, one last note that we should get to: um, Anthony Edwards, forty thousand dollar fine for some disparaging comments that he made online, homophobic comments that he made online on social media. Um, not a good look for the Timberwolves. Probably a dumb move for him to just throw something out on social media. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, bad optics. The the, the NBA, the Timberwolves, the Lynx, don't forget they're owned by the same group, right. Taylor and A-Rod and Mark right. Lurie. They, you know, they promote being all-inclusive. We've gone to a number of games. That, they talk about that when you go in the arena. And so this was a hateful message that hurt a certain group of people. Ant's got to go into damage control. Is he toxic? Now he is. I think he recovers. Yeah, it'll be fine. You know, I mean, look, the minute he skies through the air and throws down an acrobatic jam, all 19,000 fans in the arena will stand up and cheer. But he needs to learn from this. It, this is not okay. Yeah, uh, he's a young guy. He will get through this, but he's got to learn from it. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. All right. One more segment to go. It's takes of the day. Stay with us. You're watching 10,000 takes. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> It isn't just about vision, it's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Another episode of 10K Takes Television. 
just about in the books as we spray our signal to the Twin Cities, the Twin Ports, and the Iron Range. Um, we're going to get the takes of the day here shortly. But, hey, let's not ignore the most successful team in Minnesota right now. That would be the U of M, the Gopher football squad, 3-0. and They've been dominant in wins over New Mexico State, <laughs> Western Illinois, and Colorado. But now the rubber meets the road yes, Saturday in East Lansing, Michigan, against Michigan State. And Michigan State is ranked in one of the polls. They're a top 25 team. The Gophers are not ranked yet. Um, Michigan State is at home. However, the Gophers going in are a two-and-a-half point pick. So the rubber does Whoa. meet the road. How do you like them, Alex? I am surprised. Now, look, Michigan State was ranked 11th going into the game last week at Washington. Right. They got beat by the Huskies. They dug a huge hole, tried to come back, couldn't get the victory. Oh, by the way, the Washington quarterback is Michael Penix Jr., who was at Indiana. He is a good-looking QB. He got in the transfer portal. He's a lefty. And I think the Huskies are, are just thrilled to have him. But I'm surprised by that line that Michigan State is a dog in East Lansing to the Gophers. You might want to take the Spartans and the uh, two and a half points. <laughs> but you better get to that quickly because uh, the bookies might move that line a little bit as we get closer to kickoff. Yeah, that's <laughs> – I look, I those gamblers know better than I do. Vegas always seems to be right where it needs to be, right? Yeah. All right. Um, I am told it's time for takes. Yeah, well, what are you today? Are you a grumpy guardian, a giddy guardian, angry American, demanding diva? What is it? Well, speaking of the University of Minnesota, I'll keep it on the subject, but uh, we're going to talk some basketball. Men's head basketball coach Ben Johnson was brought in to try and help keep some of the local talent at home. Didn't happen this week, unfortunately. Um, Taysan Chapman had narrowed his choices down. He is a senior this year at Totino Grace, helped lead uh, Totino Grace to the 3A state championship last year, um, and he's the number one recruit in Minnesota. He has decided to go to the Ohio State University. He had narrowed it down to five schools, Ohio State, Minnesota, Kansas, Xavier, and Virginia, but uh, Ohio State wins out. And I think it's unfortunate uh, for the Gophers. Now, I know that Minnesota has other guys that are four-star recruits as well, but I think that the big thing here, the linchpin to this, is that when you see a number one recruit in Minnesota go out of the state, what does that say to the other Minnesota players who are thinking about mm. playing at the University of Minnesota and playing at Williams Arena? Maybe it's not so attractive to them. Maybe say, well, maybe I'll look at Virginia or Ohio State or whatever it is. So uh, good for uh, Taysan. Him and his, his dad is a friend of mine, TC. We've been friends for a long time. I'm happy for Taysan, but uh, the University of Minnesota, not so much. I think that they got to do a better job of keeping these guys at home. And the mood meter says you are a demanding diva. I indeed am. You want Ben Johnson to uh, seal the borders even more than he's already trying to do, and yeah. hopefully he does it better than his predecessor, yeah, well, Richard Pitino. Well, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, well, my take of the day, uh, Sunday night football this week, San Francisco at Denver. Jimmy G against Russell Wilson. It would have been Trey Lance, but the kid out of Marshall, Minnesota, by way of North Dakota State, broke his ankle last week, week two against Seattle. He's out for the year. Tough break. I hope it's a speedy recovery for uh, Trey Lance. But I'm really upset about the treatment Trey Lance received week one. If you remember, uh, San Francisco goes into Chicago. It was sloppy. It was soggy. It was rainy. It was a quagmire at Soldier Field. No doubt. Bears won 19-10. Trey Lance didn't play well. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He didn't look good, but it was only one game. But boy, did the critics pile on. They were heaping all sorts of criticism on Trey Lance, specifically Mike March and Sean Payton, and thinking, hey, this guy is a bust. They threw him under the bus. And I just thought it was highly unprofessional that you would come to that kind of a conclusion based on one game. I don't think so. I, I totally disagree with that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this much. The 49ers are happy that they kept Jimmy yes. G and did not trade him away this year. Sometimes the best trades are the ones you do not make. Correct. And on that note, we're going to FedEx out our thank yous. One to David Weld, also to Rocky, Amy and Dave Freeman. For Wally, I'm Eric saying so long. This is 10K Takes, your sports ticket.